How often are you wrong nowadays? How, how often are you experimenting with new things? I mean, someone looking from the outside in might see you iterating. Sure, here's another book, but he's the book guy. He knows how to do books, words on paper, digital, whatever, you know. Um, maybe we don't get to see all the innovation happening behind the scenes, but I'd like to know, you know, how often now are you experimenting and built into that question is a, is a backup question, which is how often should we be thinking about innovating? And then how, how often are you wrong? If I'm working hard, I'm wrong almost every single day, sometimes several times a day. Uh, behind me in all of these videos, you see bookshelves. Most of the books on these bookshelves are filled with projects I did that didn't work. And uh, I'm good enough to double down on the ones that do work, that it looks like I'm right a lot. 7,000 blog posts, half of them are below average. And 140 podcasts, some of them aren't as good as the other ones. I work for hours on something, it's perfectly polished. I go here, they say, nah, nah, nah. and then I do something because I'm on deadline and I pop it off in eight minutes and people think it's the greatest thing I ever did. I don't know. I just know that the practice involves showing up. And so I'm wrong a lot. now. We're talk there is a spectrum between being wrong about an interaction with one person who you need to connect with and being wrong on a book that you spent a year writing or a business you spent five years building, right? But we got to do all of them. So yeah, most of my errors are errors of omission, not commission, things I should have done, things I could have said, things I could have written. But there's also the stuff where I've had an interaction or written something where history said you weren't that right this time, or where the market said, nah, we're just not gonna sign up for this. We don't think it's a good idea. And again, you protect against the downside. The downside for me used to be that if I lost 500 bucks, I was out of the game. So I had to take very little swings. Now I can afford to lose 500 bucks and still be in the game. So I take slightly bigger swings. But no, I'm not busy starting a startup with 100 employees, because that's a swing that would freak me out. But if we try to attach ourselves to the outcome, we will sacrifice the process. That the practice says, the outcome matters, that's why I'm here, it's why it's work. But no, I'm not sacrificing the practice to reverse engineer some outcome that I have no control over. Because I have no control over it. So therefore, all I can do is merely do this work. So there are two magic tricks. Hey, it's Seth. The first magic trick was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we gave or sold everyone a television set. And suddenly a few people could reach a lot of people with stories and video. And the second magic trick, you already know it. We gave almost everybody or sold everybody a camera. And now we're not just consumers, we're creators. And it's a thrill to be here with my friend Brian to talk to you about what it means to be a creator and what kind of ruckus you're capable of making. Hi, Brian, how are you? Thank you for being here, Seth. It's always a pleasure. The new book, The Practice, is amazing, inspiring. I think for all of us, I speak for all of us in the world, all the creatives at this very moment, uh, thank you for writing this book. It's, it's what I personally uh, have needed for a long time. And I think there's also several common threads that have run through the 19 other best-selling books that you've written. Um, if we're counting, that, you know, maybe this is coming at a really good time in the history of the world, at least for me it is. And so I want to visit some of these topics. I want to break down the practice. And I, I want to get tactical too, because I know a lot of people who are watching this, they're artists, they're creators, maybe they're writing scripts or screenplays, maybe they're editors, directors, creating some sort of video. Um, and I think they could really benefit from hearing some of the things that are written in the book. Well, I will, tr I will do my best. The fact that it's a festival is poignant to me and a little bit ironic. So yeah, exactly. It's a good place to be. I wanted to ask you about self-talk. Um, to me, you seem someone who's so resilient, someone who's maybe conditioned themselves to shun the non-believers, uh, something you've talked to me about before. 
but I want to talk about the self-talk that's in your head and and how you are able to either fight off the voices or the voice the resistance if you want to call it that you've talked about Steve Pressfield a lot um, the lizard brain but what does Seth Godin's self-talk sound like right now so high school is a disaster for a whole bunch of reasons. And one of the reasons is it happens at the very same time we are developing the ability to intentionally talk to ourselves. Most people, if they're honest, cannot remember what they said to themselves when they were seven years old or 11 years old. But once we hit high school, it's loud. That voice in our head, it's working overtime. I think it might be related to our sexual awakening at the same time. But at the very same time that that voice is getting loud, so are the other voices in the lunchroom. So are the other voices on the bus. And we tend to mimic what's around us. If you grow up where everyone is speaking French, the voice in your head is going to be French. And if you come of age with high school voices in your head, it's not unusual to develop high school voices. And I think growing up is a persistent effort to get rid of those voices. And a lot of it has to do with fitting in. A lot of it has to do with listening to inappropriate feedback, criticism from people who are more afraid than you are. Uh, a lot of it has to do with surface achievement, which isn't really that important compared to the other kind. So for me, the work, and I have to do the work every single day, is to calm down, quiet down, isolate myself from the voices that aren't going to help me do my work and to figure out how to amplify the other kind, the ones that are about the practice and the work we do, not about fitting in, standing out, or winning. And so what is going through your mind right now? What are some of the things that are, are trying, the darts that are trying to get through but are just pinging off Captain America's shield, you know? <laughs> You know, when I'm doing a video interview, I uh, have a different voice than when I'm doing a podcast. Because when I'm making a podcast, I know that there's 100,000 people listening, but not right this second. And right this second, I care about making sure I'm landing with Brian, making sure I'm leaving space for him. And then it reminds me that Brian is just a stand-in for 170 million people who might be watching this. And... What if they don't speak English? What if they want something I don't want? What if they're dealing with something I'm not dealing with? What if they are suffering from trauma or they're just overwhelmed with delight? How can I possibly be there for all of them? And so it's this balancing act between being present for this person who's so generous to spend time with you and realizing that if I extend myself too far, I will disappear. So that sounds a little bit like at least the entry into what a lot of people will uh, frame as imposter syndrome, or maybe it's starting to worry about the critic. Can we talk about that a little bit? Uh, personally, sure. um, you've given me a lot of great advice over the years. You've said you, you don't read your one-star Amazon reviews because... Or my five-star Amazon reviews. You can't have it both ways. Yeah, you don't read reviews. You don't have comments open on, on anything, and that's by design. Can you talk about that a little bit? And then I have a follow-up question. So a couple things to say about feedback and criticism. The first one is this. Most of the negative criticism you get is not helpful. And it's not helpful because it's simply a way of someone saying, it's not for me. So... Of someone who loves a steakhouse leaves a one-star review of a vegetarian restaurant on Yelp. Should the vegetarian restaurant now start serving steak? I don't think so. This person told us about themselves, not about the restaurant. And if you give a one-star review to a brilliant book like Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, you're not saying anything about the book. You're telling us something about yourselves. Isabel should not read that. It will not help her. And that's the first part. And then the second part is people who do exist in your audience, who it is for, most of them are bad at giving feedback. Most of them are terrible at telling you something that will make your work better. It's a craft. It's a skill. I'm not surprised they don't know how to do that. If you can find someone who knows how to do that, what a gift. I mean, 
Think about a movie like 2001, which is regularly considered one of the 10 greatest movies of all time. When it came out, people walked out of the theater. When it came out, ostensibly talented critics hated that movie. What if Stanley Kubrick had had a focus group before he released that movie? First 45 minutes with no speaking. Well, we wouldn't be talking about monoliths the way we're talking about them right now, would we? And the reason is because Stanley Kubrick had something to say, and he willingly ignored people who didn't know how to give feedback. So I'm going to just play the other side of the coin just for fun because I, I already sort of know where you're going to go with this. But will you tell the Brussels sprouts story and why as a restaurant owner it might be tempting if your customers are coming in for Brussels sprouts uh, wrapped in bacon to customize something for a, a vegetarian or a vegan uh, when the money is good. Why shouldn't we do that? Yeah, so I mean, you're, you told the story. It was David Chang who is now a big deal. He wasn't a big deal when I was going there on Saturdays for lunch with my family. The place was half empty. And uh, there were 22 things on the menu. And one of them, one of the most popular ones, was Brussels sprouts with bacon. I don't eat bacon. I've been a vegetarian a long time. And the first three or four or five times we went, we'd be sitting at the grill, at the, you know, the little counter, and I'd ask for them without bacon. Now, this is a win-win because they don't have to buy the bacon, and I don't have to separate out the bacon. And they said, sure. And the last time, I think it was David, I'm not sure, the person behind the grill said, you know, there's 22 items on the menu, and only two of them are for vegetarians. You'd be better off going to a place a block away. In fact, there's a good place right over there. And that was the day that Momofuku became Momofuku. Because there's 8 or 10 million people in New York City they don't need all of them to be customers. They need 2,000 of them. They need the right 2,000 people to love that restaurant for it to be a success. And gently and generously asking the non-customers to leave, that's a generous act. And so I think you will know that you are on the right path when you say to a potential client, there's somebody else who can do a better job. Let me call them for you. When you say to somebody who offers you a great gig to do something that you wouldn't be proud of, to say, no, thank you, but I know where I should send you. This is not offensive to the person who asked for it. It's a generous act. But if you're not willing to do that, then we know who you are. You're making average stuff for average people, and you can do better than that. I love that. So many thoughts are going through my mind. I mean, I think we've all been there. We've done stuff or worked places. We, maybe we stayed working there too long or we, we took on a project. We knew that the clients were jerks, but we did it for the money. Or maybe we, you know, we made a bad movie because we needed the money, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a tough call when you want to stay true to your values, but you also need to buy Cheerios and milk for the kiddos. Oh, it's, you know, I watched Adaptation from Charlie Kaufman a couple nights ago, and I don't know him. He is a genius. He is a contributor. He makes things better. And, um, but I started, I was curious, so I started looking through uh, his entries online, and it turns out he was one of the people called in to make Kung Fu Panda 2. And I think that Charlie might be a little out of balance. Because there is nothing wrong with doing one for the money and one for the show. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm going to make a commercial movie proud that it is what it is for who it is. And then I'm going to take the goodwill that earned me to do a movie that almost nobody understands. And I want to do it my way. Because if you're going to be in this industry and you're not just going to shoot with your Sony Alpha on your own, then you're going to need cash to make your stuff. And you can rail against the industry every single day and refuse to be part of it. Or you could write the funniest comedy ever written, knowing that you didn't make great art, you just made people smile. And then you could take that money, that credibility, and go make the movie you want to make. I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. I think where we get into trouble is when we do the work hating it every day and never get around to doing the parts that we love. I think we get into trouble when we compromise our reputation and blame it on somebody else. If you're going to make a movie, 
It should be a movie you're proud of, but that doesn't have to mean it's the movie you would have made if no one else had a say. Those are different things. Yeah, I like that distinction. You've uh, taught me so much about thinking about two really important questions. Well, there's really three, but they're there's sort of three baked into two, which is the all important what's it for and who it's for. And to me, the what it's for is the strategy, the plan, the goal, the objective, what do you want to accomplish? And maybe your Kung Fu Panda 1 or your Kung Fu Panda 2 is just a means to an end that you could do your 2001 Space Odyssey movie and, you know, have some cash. Um, I want to ask for clarification on probably one of the most profound, at least for me, inspiring messages in the book, which is your recommendation, your counsel, not to attach the outcome uh, to the work, to ourselves. Can you break that down and help us understand? Because I, I hear the words, I'm really trying to let that sink in and seep in deep so that I can embrace that and live that, but it is so hard. Yeah. All right, so uh, Charlie Kaufman made a movie and it got picked by Sundance. Does that tell us something about Charlie Kaufman or does that tell us something about the movie? What does it mean to get picked by Sundance, to be in a festival? Does that mean you won as a person? Okay. What about getting rejected? If your movie doesn't make it into Sundance, are you a bad person? I think not. And I think that you need to make the movie you're going to make in the way you want to make it, knowing its trajectory. And your goal might be to get into Sundance. That could be part of the movie you want to make. And then when it doesn't get in to whatever festival you have in mind, you've learned something about what you made. And you've learned something about the jury. Maybe the jury didn't have room for the kind of movie you made this year. Maybe the person on the jury had a favor they had to trade to somebody else. Maybe they just didn't like what you made. Or maybe you can learn from the fact that you got rejected, and the next time you make a movie like that, you'll make it better, and it will get in. But at no point in any of this should you think that getting in is, means you're a good person and not getting in means you're not a good person, because those aren't the same thing. And if you are spending your days willing and wishing and hoping to get picked, and you are spending your nights beating yourself up because you didn't get picked, you have no time to do your work. And so my argument is, let us be clear about who it's for and what's it for, the change we seek to make. And then let us go all in to make our work and leave aside our willing and hoping, our attachment to the outcome. Because the outcome is the outcome whether or not we are attached to it. Yeah, because I can hear the chatter, I can hear the pushback, like, of course the outcome matters, right? If, if we just hear a little bit of, if we just hear a partial piece of that advice, which is don't care about the outcome, well, of course we have to care about the outcome. We, you know, we don't set out to make bad stuff, right? Unless we do, but it is so hard. I mean, you talk about the 800 rejection letters that you got, um, do you, do you still remember those people? Do you still remember the words that, like me, do they ever come ringing back in your ears sometimes? Especially when you're succeeding. Does that ever happen to you? Um, it, there's only a few I know by heart. Um, I, I think it was 40 years ago. I think the key is this. There's a difference between caring and attachment, and there's a difference between it mattering and attachment. Attachment means I am somehow related to that. Attachment means it will be the narrative of my days. It will be the place I go to determine if I am worthy. That never pays off. If you spend your whole life thinking about dying, you're not spending much time being alive. And I got to tell you, we're all going to die. So you shouldn't get attached to the fact that you want to live forever, because you won't. And if you get attached to it, you enjoy the moment. And so what I'm saying is, when we are doing our work, we are doing our work. We have a goal. We have a destination. We are aware of it. But we are not attached to it. So the, the riff that I like is, uh, people talk about, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? 
which I think is a silly question because I'd want invisibility and flight and time travel and things like that. The better question is, what would you do if you knew you were going to fail? If you were sure you weren't going to get into Sundance, then what movie would you make? If you were sure that your script was going to be turned down by every studio in Hollywood, then what script would you write? What would be worth writing even if you got turned down? It turns out, ironically, paradoxically, if that's what you write, you're probably not going to get turned down. Yeah, I love that because it is very freeing, right? It releases you from the pressure both ways because you're right, it does... Success and failure can cut the same way. You can start, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid and believing you're all that because you won an Academy Award once because you were in the right place at the right time or you had the right jury or the right script or you found magic, you know, maybe legitimately. But you're right. If you start attaching yourself to the positive outcome to it, it also leads down a roll of trouble. Correct. Yeah. Um, let's go back to rejection because it is definitely a trigger for me. And I don't know if you can relate with this at all, but sometimes when I feel rejected, I do this self-sabotage thing where it's like I already... It's, it's, not, it's not just assuming that everything's going to go badly, but it's like, I deliberately make sure that it happens, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, can you relate with this at all? Okay, so anxiety, not the anxiety that a mental health professional might help with, but everyday anxiety, is experiencing failure in advance. And it's even worse than failure. Because failure is real. You don't have to wait and wonder. It's here. And I experienced it, and that sucked. But... Anxiety is imagining all the different ways the failure could come and when it's going to come and suffering the whole time. So it's easy to imagine a scene in a screenplay where somebody walks in finally getting the meeting with the studio executive and just punches them right in the face. <laughs> because at least then it's over with. Yeah. Right? I already know you're going to say no. Right. There's no chance because it's the chance that makes it even worse. Because we're so attached to that glimmer, that slice, that we spend part of our time dreaming that it's true and most of our time uh, in mourning because it didn't work out. And so what, if you find yourself doing that, I used to do it all the time. I still do it a little bit. Um, you need to look where the trigger is. What starts you on that cycle? And work to extinguish the trigger. Because if the cycles keep expanding... They're getting in the way of your work as a creative. And don't use it as fuel. Using it as fuel is really the problem because it doesn't, as my friend Brian says, Brian Koppelman, it doesn't burn clean. If you're using revenge or glory as the fuel to do this work, not generosity, then you will burn out. Yeah. And, and I like the message of the book because it seems to me like the antidote really is, as you say, in the practice. You say, show me your bad script. Show me your, you know, terrible video. A and so, am I right? Is that the antidote? Is, is, is doing the work day in, day out the answer? It, it's the only way forward. Because if you do the work day in, day out, you're too busy to develop that noise in your head. And your craft has to get better. Because you're discovering all the things that don't work. You're discovering all the dead ends on your way to moving forward. So if we're doing that work, 7,500 blog posts in a row, right? If we're doing that work, oh, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one, everything will get better at the same time that the noise in our head starts to subside. I heard a story, maybe it was a rumor, I don't know where I heard it. Um, I heard that you got offered the shot to be one of the sharks on Shark Tank. And you turned yeah, they it down. Wanted, they wanted me to audition to be the nasty judge. Yeah, the, the, the part played by the other guy with less hair. His name will not be mentioned. But ironically, 40 years ago, he bought the company that I worked at a year after I left. That, Isn't that weird? That is. It's almost like, um, what's that Seinfeld episode where he's living in a bizarro world? It's like, and he is the antithesis of you. 
he's very greedy. He's a savage. And you are this genuine, you know, generous. That's interesting. Yeah. And I said, you mean you want me to trade uh, what I stand for to be famous? And I said, what? why is that a good deal? I'm not interested. Again, these are the, um, and maybe we, that's a good segue into talking about the importance of having a personal brand. We've wrestled with this a little bit before where, you know, I've said that we all are a brand and you said, no, I'm a human being. I'm not a brand. But can you talk about personal branding? And because I think that's sure. what you're talking about is establishing a set of values, uh, parameters, limitations, if you want to call it that, uh, constraints. You like to talk about constraints. Maybe yeah. break that down a little bit into personal branding. Well, OK, so. My glib answer to you is incomplete. Uh, everybody has a chance or probably does have a brand. A brand is not a logo, and a brand does not mean you are a company. A brand is a shorthand. It is what we expect when we hire you, what we expect when you walk into the room, what we expect when we see your name on the credits. And so if it's a Spike Jones movie or a Spike Lee movie, these people have brands because they, their work rhymes with itself. They stand for something. And you can have one. Lots of people have one. The class clown, when you were eight years old, had one. That if the class clown opened their mouth, people had a hunch about what was going to come out. And if you don't want to be a wandering generality, if you want to be a meaningful specific, as Zig would say, you have to pick, what is that? So Nike should probably not open a chain of fast food restaurants. That would be a mistake because then Nike wouldn't stand for anything. And you should, pro not you, Brian, but you, the viewer, should probably not say, what do you need made? I will make it for you. Because now you've given up any hope of standing for anything. Can we stay on that uh, sort of value proposition theme and talk about money? I, I know a lot of creatives have a hard time knowing what to charge for their work or feeling like a sellout. And you've talked before about how money is a story. Can you talk about price and about story and maybe give some advice to creatives who are trying to, you know, earn what they're worth? Yeah. So there are uh, two places w where you can succeed and one place where you will fail. Uh, it is possible to succeed with, you can pick anyone and I'm anyone, except I'm cheaper than them. Because you'll have plenty of business all day long. You might lose money, but you'll have plenty of business. And the other thing you can say is, you'll pay a lot, but you'll get more than you pay for. And that means you won't get very much business, but people who want a lot more than they want the money will pick you or people like you. So if we think about photographers, my friend Jill Greenberg will not shoot a portrait of you for $89. If you multiply it by 500, she might shoot a portrait of you because she's the one and only Jill Greenberg. Take it or leave it. You'll pay a lot, but you get more than you pay for. Let's go back to this idea of being unique, but also recognizing that sometimes you do find a cash cow, right? Not a purple cow, but a cash cow in this sense. When I worked at Universal Pictures, I was on the brand marketing and strategy team in home entertainment, which was responsible for basically movies on demand, DVD and whatnot. At the time, Blockbuster was still a thing, and we also sold movies. And when I was there at the studio, we had this uh, movie that came out called The Fast and the Furious. Mm -hmm. Wildly successful Vin Diesel movie and, you know, a uh, great cast. And I left, you know, after a, f a few years, and they just kept making that movie, Fast and the Furious 1. I think they've made eight or nine of them by now. Yep. They're just taking it to the bank. Um... So why is that good or not good? Because um, I want to stay on this, you know, this sure. how to earn what you're worth. You know, they've, they've tapped into something, a franchise, because we used to call it a franchise. Yeah. Um, whether it's a movie with a sequel or, a, you know, three of them, sometimes they make one, one too many. But what's they the difference in the value? <laughs> what's the That's difference how you in know value? you're supposed to stop after you make one too many. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing as a filmmaker too. If if you get a, if you have a hit, it's yeah. really easy to make part two, you know. Okay. But so how do you know whether or not to make part two? 
a, a couple things. First, let me explain what the word cash cow means. Uh, it comes from the Boston Consulting Group. It's a grid of uh, projects that either spin off cash or grow. And so you've got something uh, called the dog, which is not spinning off cash and it's not growing. You should get rid of that. It shouldn't be in your portfolio. You've got a star, which is something that is spinning off cash and growing. You love those. Then you've got the cash cow, which spins off cash but doesn't necessarily grow. That's what sequels do. And as an artist, a creator, as someone who wants to be in culture, it really helps to have a portfolio of at least three of the four quadrants because you can use money from one to fund your work on the other. So if we look at a visual artist like Jeff Koons, Jeff Koons makes millions and millions of dollars making balloon animals, and he takes some of that money to develop the technology to make the next thing. A studio says, we know we're going to make bank making another James Bond movie. We can't make James Bond movies every day, but we can make one this year, and we'll use that money to make four other movies, hoping that one of them turns into something that we can build our future on. And if you're an individual, you can do the same thing. Now, morally, is it okay to make a Fast and Furious movie? Well, the last time I checked, they weren't forcing anyone to pay to watch one. So if it's voluntary and it's not making anything worse, then I think morally you're off the hook. I don't think it's okay to market cigarettes. I don't think it's okay to open a vape store. I don't think it's okay to dump stuff in the river because those hurt think, people. You're trading money to be a bad person. But in the case of film, film has no promise, guarantee that every single film you make is going to open people's eyes and expand their horizons in ways that no one else could imagine. You can do that if you want, but you're also allowed to just let people have a pleasant Sunday afternoon. So I think morally you're off the hook, but we need clarity. Because if you set out to do something in film that has never been done before, and you make seven uh, Fast and Furious movies in a row, well, now you're being incoherent, and you're going to die with your dreams inside of you. You use the phrase, off the hook. Let's uh, now recontextualize that phrase. And you talk about being on the hook, and why on the hook is where you want to be. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Okay, so fish don't like to be on the hook for understandable reasons. Very few good things happen if you're on the hook and you're a fish. But creators, that's the only place we can be. Because what it means to be on the hook is you made a promise to somebody and now you have to keep it. What it means to be on the hook is that you claimed something and now you have to deliver and so our goal as generous creators is to be able to go to the people we serve and say, please put me on the hook. I will make this promise if you will give me a chance to keep it. What's the difference between, like, if I've got a video on Vimeo that's on private and public, how do I know when I should be on the hook or off, you know, private or public? Right. <laughs> That's hard. Right. So what's, the, what's it for, right? If the goal of a video is for eight people to engage with it in a way that takes them to a new place, it should be on private, and you should, in, you should invite those eight people to see it. If the goal of the video is to spread to people you have no contact with, if its goal is to bump into people who don't expect it and who aren't necessarily engaging in a bargain with you, then it needs to be in public. But you got to be really clear about what you're going to do with the feedback you get. So if you take a video that's particular and personal and idiosyncratic and you make it public and no one watches it, that's not your fault. That's not what you, you didn't set out to make a thing that was popular. You set out to make a thing that was personal. They're not the same. And social media has taught us that likes mean people like you and friends mean people are your friends. They're not. That's just what they call that button. And so don't play into the social media trap. Instead, be really clear with yourself about what it's for. People have shown me stuff and they've said, this is my best work, but no one's watching it. And I said, did you try to make something that was viral? Because this seems pretty intellectual for something that's viral. 
And they're like, no, I wanted to make something intellectual. I said, so then what are you complaining about? You made what you wanted to make. You have to forgive the audience for not wanting to go on the journey that you want them to go on because they don't want to go. How much of your work in advance, like, let's take the practice for example, do you send just a chapter or do you send half the book or the full galley copy for feedback to the right people? And how many do you send well, them to? So there are very few people I ask for feedback from because it's a skill and it's a huge ask. If uh, I'm very good at this sort of thing, I've advised you know, 20 people who've written important bestsellers on their books. I do it for free for my friends. But if they're going to ask me for my feedback, they better take it because it's a big gift to do that for somebody. So when I said to Peter Gabriel, would you mind blurbing this? I wasn't asking Peter, please help me make this a better book. I wasn't looking for feedback. Uh, so the feedback on this book came from my editor, Nikki Papadopoulos, couple people in my family, and Brian Koppelman. And uh, the best feedback I got was not surprisingly from my editor. She changed the title and helped me uh, adjust some parts of it. But you really want to find professionals. And if you have to pay them, you should pay them because they're worth it. Uh, one trick that I use, which I recommend for people who make film as well, is after the whole thing is done, but before I have submitted it, I hand it off to an editor I have never met. Not a line editor, not a structural editor, but a copy editor, commas, semicolons, dashes. And in four days for $400 or $800, it gets magically clean. And it doesn't change any of the words in the book. And then when I hand it into my publisher, they're stunned because it looks like I know how to write because all the commas and everything is in the right order. Um, I think it pays to, let's just say you're a cinematographer, storyteller, filmmaker, to have a professional editor edit your thing, the last thing before people see it, or to have someone do the, the audio sweetening, or to play with the sound, because human beings don't know why they notice that, but they do, and there's no shame. Even if you're on a low budget, nobody said you have to do every single thing yourself. What was the working title of the book, by the way? It was called Trust Yourself. You can see an excerpt of the book at trustyourself.com. I bought the domain. That's how much I liked the title. Um, but then we changed it. Maybe one of my final questions is, can you talk about collaboration? You know, in this age of being quarantined, we're still in L.A. here, you know, for the unforeseeable future. But collaboration, whether you're... You know, I know you've been working by yourself, for yourself, forever, probably since the 80s, right? Um, talked about uh, collaboration, some of the things that you've learned how to do it well, and, and why it's so necessary. Yeah, someone called into my Akimbo podcast and asked me about this. And they said, do I think Sergeant Pepper could have been built in the age of Zoom? And not only do I think it could have been, I think it would have been more likely. I think that if we can strip away the boundaries of time and space, um, particularly space, to collaborate with someone, not just because they also live in Liverpool, but because uh, they have something we need and we have something they need, really cool things can happen. I am not good at, that, at the Sgt. Pepper thing. I'm just not, so I don't try to do it. It doesn't give me satisfaction, but I know other people who that's the way they work the best. So in this moment... There's no excuse for being alone if you don't want to be alone. You should go put together your support circle and put together your collaborators. Be the organizer of that and intentionally make it true. So that just uh, reminded me of one other question I wanted to ask, which is deadlines. So how important are constraints, deadlines, parameters? I know a friend uh, who just finished a full-length documentary film uh, and it took them five years to complete. Not because that's how long it takes, but nope. because that's how long they took. Yep. I think the whole thing could have been done in, you know, less than 12 months. So uh, talk about deadlines. Right. Maybe it's... Well, so yeah. in their defense, I can type a book in three days. Knowing which words to type take a little longer than that. 
But leaving that aside, I have very strong feelings about this. Number one, constraints are your friend. You will never have unlimited time and resources. Don't try. Figure out what the constraints are and live with them. If you're going to shoot with this kind of equipment, that's all the equipment you get. The end. Go to the edge of your constraints. Do not try to ease them. Uh, and how the do other you, one... Well, yeah. How do you know which constraints to, to create for yourself? How do you know... Because, you know, I think if it were left to our own design, you know, if, where, where should I go to travel? Well, I'm going to pick Hawaii every time because it's sunny and it's beautiful and it's never rainy. You know, it's just all palm trees and sunshine. But that's probably not going to help me. I, I need the opposite, like pushing back sometimes. So how do I know which constraints and to what well, extent? Well, you just answered your own question, right? If the purpose of vacation is X, Y, and Z and Hawaii does that, Stop worrying. Go to Hawaii. What's it for? What's it for, right? So my blog, I know what my blog is for. And there's a reason there's no pictures and no audio and no video and no this and no that. My blog has constraints. So I don't have to spend any time at all saying, what stock photo should I put here? Because there aren't any. It wouldn't make my blog better. I made that decision once. I might unmake it one day, but I don't review it very often. And, you know, Steven Soderbergh shot a movie entirely on smartphones. Well, that's a constraint. He can afford to do it a different way. Let's see what we can do. Build the boundaries so then you can go back to work. And the second half, which I made this decision in 1983, and I have never, ever worried about the decision I made, which is don't miss a deadline, period. Don't go near them. Don't even get close to them. Deadlines have the word dead in them. Don't go near the line. Never. Period. It's done when your time is up. The end. Don't ask for more time. If you can make that rule once, you can get the work done. Otherwise, you're going to spend all your creative work trying to change that boundary. It is the juiciest boundary. You don't want to go near it because more time feels like perfect and more time is not your friend. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot and hang from the rear view. Uh -huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents. Shotgun riders, too biased, they all liars. I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired. But I'm never giving up, that's why I'm kinda admired. Role model, like it or not, I gotta play it. Sugarcoat the rhyme sometimes, but still say it. Said I was quitting at 40, is just a fib. I'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib. You ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? Cried over every opportunity wasted good and bad news which one you want first either way you pick the bad still gonna hurt you the worst i never got the bask in the fruits of the label and i never got the cash from that dude from the label i'm just thinking back Retrospect, I would have did it the same. Uh -huh. In hindsight, I'm the only one to blame. Uh -huh. I ain't picky, I'm just real specific. I want nothing less than terrific. I know y'all yeah, get it. I'm aggressive, so our style is clashing. Yeah. Killer instinct, and I play with passion. Yeah. I'd rather be hated for being one of the realest than get a lot of love for these overrated appearance. Ooh. I can stand on skill alone, but I'm a package deal. Yeah. I can write the whole song and rap for real. Yeah. I got my head in the cloud with a pun intended. I don't need to see nobody i don't want no visits introverted i just flirt with the music small circles how i choose it stay away from squares they the one that look like a l7 i've been doing this since i was 11 and the shit gets real